to turn the corner with a block in front of him. He's to the goal line and in. Kamara wow. hit outside the end zone, but with second effort and that great balance of his, he falls into the end zone for a two-yard touchdown run. Well, the Saints prevail over the Panthers 31-21 with plays like that one to put the team solidly at the top of the division. The voice of the Saints, Jim Henderson, joins us now by phone for his black and gold rewind. Jim, thanks for joining us this morning. My pleasure. How are you today? I'm doing great. You know, when Alvin and Mark Ingram are together and clicking, uh, the Saints are a hard team to beat. Boy, they are. You know, before uh, this tandem got together, the chunk plays always had to come out of the passing game. Now they're getting them on the ground game. Uh, this is against a defense that was third ranked against the run in the NFL coming into that game, allowing just 83 yards per game. Saints got 148. It was a, a defense that had only allowed an NFL low four rushing touchdowns in 11 games. The Saints got three of them yesterday. And the Saints got the benefit of some great turnovers. Michael Pilardi dropped the ball on a punt return. That was a gorgeous play. That was a big play. The Saints were up 14-7 at the time. He dropped the ball and then tried to complete a pass uh, in desperation, fell incomplete. Saints took over at the Carolina 31, put it in in six plays with that touchdown pass from Breeze to Thomas. They're up 21-7. And it could have been worse. You know, the Saints were driving for what looked like to be another touchdown when uh, Josh Hill fumbled the ball. and. That allowed the Panthers to score just before halftime to make it 21-14, but could easily have been 28-7 at the time the Saints went to the locker room at halftime. That just worked out great. Now, the Houdat Nation played a big old role in this game as well. Uh, they were loud. It sounded like the old dome. It really did. I mean, that was a playoff atmosphere in the Dome yesterday. The fans were really into it from beginning to end, and they contributed mightily to it. And I think it set the aggressive tone for the entire game for the Saints when they went on that opening drive and scored on that Camara two-yard touchdown run and fourth and goal. Um, that was a big, gutsy call by Sean Payton, who pressed all the right buttons again yesterday, and the Saints never took their foot off the pedal. Okay, Thursday is a big game with our rivals, the Falcons. Will we be ready for this game? I mean, this is a quick turnaround. It's a short week. Uh, you have to deal with this every year, it seems, and so the Saints will deal with it going on the road again on Thursday after playing on a Sunday, but it's against a team that you know well, uh, a team that really struggled yesterday, didn't score a touchdown in the loss to the Vikings, and it's a short trip and playing a division rival that sometimes makes the preparation a little bit easier, and certainly the Saints are playing at the top of their game right, right now after just a, a stumble against the Rams. You worried that perhaps that was going to be the start of a decline on this football team. It was only just a uh, a little blip on the radar. And let's talk about the defense quickly. Crawley really showed up big time at cornerback. He played great. Um, and this, this kid is one of the surprises of the team, and the team has a lot of them. Uh, this is a guy that couldn't start in the first two weeks of the season, even though he had a good preseason. And the guy that they replaced him with uh, is no longer on the team, Devontae Harris. They cut him because of his inability to really cover receivers and, and to tackle and make the plays that you'd expect of a cornerback. So it was great to, uh, to rest Lattimore again. Um, hopefully he's going to be back. Uh, in full at full speed with Julio Jones and that core of receivers. The Panthers don't have a lot of down-the-field threats in the passing game, so the Saints were able to rest him, and Crawley made some big plays coming off uh, that uh, abdominal injury of his. Well, I've got two words to say to you, Jim Henderson. Who dat? Who dat? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks for joining us this morning. Thank you. All right. You can get more of Jim Henderson's thoughts on the Saints today on Fox 8. Catch his award-winning commentary at 5. The Black and Gold Review Show kicks off at 1035. And be sure to get your questions in using the final word feature on the Final Play app. It's 819. <laughs> So Saints fans, I, I mean, it's been a while since we've seen them so excited mm -hmm. and so stoked. And for very good reasons, too. They win three of their last four now, and I believe they're guaranteed the NFC wow. South Championship. Nice. So it's what you do all year long for this. Last year, the Falcon running back tandem of Devontae Freeman and Tevin Coleman ran roughshod over the Saints. Oh, if we could only find a couple like that, you might have wished. But as the Saints head to Atlanta Thursday night, they have a pair that beats the Falcons two of a kind, hands down. Ingram and Kamara, the Saints have shock and awe, a pairing that is not only the best in Saints history, but on a pace to be the best in NFL history. No two teammates have ever each exceeded 1,500 yards from scrimmage in the same season as both are on track to do. Best in NFL history. 
How does that sound? And how must it sound to every general manager in the NFL who needed a running back and passed on Alvin Kamara through 66 picks of last April's draft? The native of Norcross, Georgia, 20 miles northeast of Atlanta, will return as no stranger to football fans in the Peach State, where he was Georgia's Mr. Football at Norcross High. The son of Liberian parents did the same things there that he later did at Tennessee with limited opportunities. Starting just 8 of 24 games as a ball, sharing carries in a deep core of running backs. But if you look at his highlights there, you see the exact same things we're seeing here. Balance, power, speed, vision, hands, a smooth, slippery, almost effortless running style that leads you to suspect he secretly sprayed his uniform with WD-40. Look at those highlights, which include breaking six tackles on a touchdown run. And listen to CBS lead SEC analyst in Gary Danielson exclaim, he's as good as you'll see this year. In his next year, his first year as a professional, he and Mark Ingram are as good as the NFL may have seen ever. How about that? I didn't realize they were on pace for that first in NFL history. All sorts of records are falling. There are all sorts of comparisons to the great running backs of all time. But as I've discussed with the guys in the Saints office, it's hard to really categorize Kamara. I mean, you look at yeah. some of the great runners in NFL history. Earl Campbell, you could certainly describe him. Uh, Barry Sanders, quick twitch runner. Even Walter Payton. But Kamara has such a unique and vast skill set, there's almost nobody to compare him to. Now, Marshall Falk is another possibility. And quick turnaround, Falcons this week on the road. It's always difficult, those Thursday night games. Yeah, this will be the fifth time in the last six years the Saints have gone on the road to play on Thursday night, which hardly seems fair, but you just deal with it. So right. you think in the back offices, those who pass on Kamara, big mistake. Big oh, mistake. Oh, yeah. oh. And even the Saints admit, and Sean Payton said so today, if we knew he was this good, we would have drafted him higher. I remember back uh, when Bum Phillips was here with the Saints, uh, the Cowboys were also being compared to the Oilers when he was in Houston because the Cowboys came up with all these great free agent signings. And Bum would always say if they were that smart, they would have drafted these guys. <laughs> Very true. All right. Thanks a lot, Thanks. Jim. Jim's not done today, by the way. He returns tonight to answer questions about the Saints. Use our final play app to submit a question. You'll get answers uh, during Jim's Black and Gold Review that airs tonight after Fox 8 News at 10. Jim Henderson's Black and Gold Review is sponsored by your Southern Quality Ford dealer, built for tough. And 2017 Nissan Titan. With America's best bumper-to-bumper -bumper limited truck warranty, Nissan Titan. Take on any job. And Slide Hill Memorial Hospital in partnership with Oshner. Fourth and goal from the two. Kamara's the lone setback. Pitch it to him right. Trying to turn the corner with a block in front of him. He's to the goal line and in. Wow. And that's the kind of rhythm the Saints sought for all last week against the Rams and never fouled. Alvin Kamara takes a licking and keeps on ticking, and the Saints keep on winning. Alongside the voice, you just heard him, Jim Henderson. I'm Juan Kincaid. Week 13, same as week 3 for the Saints when it comes to the Panthers. When they beat the Panthers then, coming off a defeat as they were this week, having lost to the Rams the week before. And really, though, this time, beating the Panthers at their own game. That's a mistake-free yeah. offense, reliance on the running game, and a tough physical defense. The first game plan worked the second time around. All right, get to the headlines now. Headline number one. Iron sharpens iron, Jim. Everybody wondered how would the Saints run the football against a defense in the Panthers that was third against the run in the NFL coming into it. Well, I think we found out. 72-yard run by Ingram, the longest that the Panthers have given up this season. They'd only been allowing 83 yards per game rushing. The Saints had 148 yesterday. They'd given up an NFL low, four rushing touchdowns. The Saints had three by themselves yesterday. That first touchdown told you all you needed to know about Sean Payton's approach to this game. They wanted to run it down the Panthers' throats because that's what they supposedly do best. And the Saints are showing, you know what, we can do that well too. Oh, certainly. I think the Panthers were extremely impressed by how physical the Saints were. And you got to be impressed with those two guys who are on their pace uh, to have a record-setting, NFL record-setting season between the two of them. That's Ingram and Kamara. You're right. They're fantastic. Headline number two, speaking of Kamara, the special man. <laughs> Let him have it. 14, no problem. <laughs> 14 touches for 126 <laughs> yards, two touchdowns. He and Ingram combined for 248 yards from scrimmage. He averaged, speaking of Kamara now, six yards after contact. You know, thank goodness for the Saints. I was looking up some of the stuff about Kamara. The teams that visited with him prior to the draft were the Saints, mm -hmm. the Panthers, 
the Bears, the Vikings, and the Eagles. Those other teams didn't think enough of him to take him within the first 66 picks. Tape don't lie when it comes to Kamara, whether it be college ball and now in the pros. He's been a special player for this football team. And listen, I know you hope every draft pick pans out well like he's doing, but no one could have predicted this much from this player based on where he was drafted. The Saints got lucky, and even yeah. they admit it. Mm -hmm. I mean, this was a kid that if you redrafted right now would probably go in the top 10 to oh, 15 yeah. picks of the first round. No doubt about that. Headline number three, back on track. Slow starts no more, Jim. No, the opening drive, as you mentioned earlier, was key. Uh, they go for uh, a touchdown with the opening drive after uh, returning the opening kickoff. Uh, they came to win, as you said, and they showed that with Kamara's touchdown run on the fourth and goal from the two, marched it downfield 75 yards, gambled on fourth down, scored, and really never looked back. Uh, the Panthers were able to forge a tie at one point, but after that, the Saints led all the way, unlike the previous two games where the Saints never led in regulation. I think the Pan Panthers are a little shell-shocked a little bit about how the Saints came out and were aggressive from the start. I think they have to be. You know, I, the Saints were their old aggressive selves, um, and, you know, before, it had to be Drew Brees. Everybody had, it yes. was always in the headlines, Drew Brees threw three touchdowns. So Drew Brees threw for 325 mm -hmm. yards if the Saints were to win. Now he's about a third paragraph guy. Yeah, you're right about that. Headline number four, containing Cam Newton, not as effective as he would have liked to have been in that game. No, but you know, he did all right. 17 to 27, 183 yards passing, couple of touchdowns, 51 yards rushing. But apart from that one 32-yard run he had, he averaged less than four yards per carry. And they really did contain him. They didn't continually stop him, but they did contain him. Dennis Allen had another good plan. It was mostly just to keep him in the pocket, make him beat him with throws downfield to wide receivers who have a hard time getting separation. I was going to say, because the bottom line is, this is maybe one of the weak uh, offensive weapon having Carolina teams I remember for a long, long time. They get rid of the, their best receiver, and then they, they have what they have left to throw to is McCaffrey. Is McCaffrey. Especially without Greg Olson. Yeah. So it's a lot of check downs, a lot of throws out wide on the periphery to McCaffrey. He's really about their only playmaker now, apart from a Cam Newton. You're right about that. Let's get to headline number five. Taste them down the road. <laughs> Taste them down a dream. <laughs> Uh, Tom Petty has uh, no competition yes. from you, even though he's no longer with us. You still are, I think. Yes. But maybe not after that <laughs> version. Um, the third string quarterback made a special team's impact. You don't see many guys wearing number seven no, covering kicks in the NFL. Um, you know, it was such a surprise to all of us, and he played so well. And you can see how much Sean Payton liked it. He came close to blocking a punt. Uh, Payton was really tickled by the way he played. And by the way, we looked up Taysom, which is... Our a, research department did, yes. It did, it, and it took us a lot of time and a vast amount of resources. <laughs> but what we have found out is that he was named after the park in Pocatello, Idaho, where he was born. Taysom Rotary Park is where he got the name Taysom from. Taysom means origin and popularity, and I will say this, it's not a very popular name over the many years, but there may be some babies being born over the new year named Taysom. What do you think? In Idaho, I would think so. <laughs> <laughs> no Taysoms from New Orleans? No. I, maybe, I, maybe in Idaho. I think the cool thing about this is that this is a guy that obviously he has the physical features mm -hmm. of a guy that plays on special teams, less of that of a quarterback. and. As a player, when you come into the NFL, you want to play. Right. This is his opportunity to play, and he yep. probably never imagined this is how he'd be playing. You know, and I was thinking, are there any other quarterbacks who play special teams in the NFL? Probably the only one that came to mind was mm -hmm. is Joe Webb. He used to play yeah. for the Vikings. Yep. He's now a member of the Bills, and he's mostly a special teamer, but he's your emergency quarterback <laughs> as a third quarterback, and uh, Buffalo may need him. There may be some Taysom Hill jerseys in the shops coming up mm. at the end of the year. Christmas lists are being made out. All right. Winning every winning team has unsung heroes, and Sunday was a prime example of under-the-radar players making big plays. Sean Bazan shows you the pivotal contributions that you'll only see in his film study next. You're watching the Jim Anderson Black and Gold Review. Welcome back in. Sean Bazan joins us now because Sunday's game was all about the hustle. No doubt about that. It's a difficult thing to quantify, right? But you know it when you see it. Effort. Trying hard on every play. Sounds simple enough, but it doesn't, doesn't always happen. But for this year, for this team, it's shown up a lot. And on Sunday, there was a ton on display. I went back and pinpointed three examples. We've run out of adjectives to describe Saints rookie sensation Alvin Kamara. But let's not forget, his effort 
is always 100%. He never takes a play off. His first touchdown was the perfect example. We know the play. We saw it three weeks ago on the game-tying two-point conversion against Washington. More importantly, the Panthers saw it, and they were ready for the call. Look at the play. It's defended perfectly. No one is out of position. The Saints have one blocker for four defenders. Still, Kamara pushes on. He takes a crazy shot from Zach Thompson, but keeps his feet moving and breaks the plane for the score. Mark Ingram's 72-yard run broke an early stalemate in Sunday's game. The play was a thing of beauty. Ingram burst through the hole and weaved his way to a game-changing run. But keep your eye on number 16, Brandon Coleman. This is the epitome of effort. On the snap, he makes an initial block on James Bradbury at the 20-yard line to spring Ingram. Technically, his job is done, but Coleman isn't. As Ingram is zigging and zagging his way downfield, watch number 16 come back into your screen and make another block on Mike Adams at the 25-yard line. That's 55 yards downfield, which helped Ingram gain some additional yards. And finally, when a third-string quarterback leads the team in special teams tackles, he's earned a spot on the effort list. It takes a completely different mentality to play special teams, particularly in kickoff coverage. His first tackle is the one we're highlighting. Hill tracks down Fozzie Whitaker for the tackle, which really amped up the special teams unit. But what makes the play even more impressive is where Hill lined up. Look at him, number seven. He's second from the sideline on the opposite side, which means he had the second most distance to travel to make the play. Hmm. Hill playing special teams. Credit him and credit the head coach and special teams coaches for thinking outside the box to let him. By the way, on that Ingram run, Coleman was actually upset with himself that he slipped at the end. Just shows how much proud he has him in himself in that aspect of the game. There were at least three or four other plays that could have made the list from Sunday. Bottom line. When you hear coaches talk about the right makeup, these are the types of plays they are talking about. And what a joy that was to go back mm -hmm. and find some of those plays. I think that's the difference with this team. Mm -hmm. They're willing to make those plays and hard to argue with the results. And I think afterwards, Ron Rivera was uh, really upset by the fact that Ingram ripped off that 72-yard run when they were expecting the run and had eight in the box specifically to stop the run. And he goes 72 yards, longest run of the season against the Panthers. Man, that really was something. And I'm curious with Drew Brees' thoughts because it was an eight-man box, as he said, after the game. Normally, you check out of a play like that, but he still ran it because that's a run-heavy box. And Ingram made one, made one guy miss, and obviously you saw the blocking. And... It really kind of sprung the game. It was 7-7 at that point. It was still kind of it kind of hit a lull. So to, for him to come back and make that play, something was something. So does Taysom Hill stay on special teams? <laughs> <laughs> the big question. The big question. Yeah. Well, he looked pretty good yeah. uh, on Sunday. You can't argue with the results. Um, I mean, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Don't fix it, right? So I, I think in this case, um, I don't know who approached who with this idea because he's never played special teams at any level. Yeah ever and here he is making plays his first time ever in an NFL game but here's the question if, if Sean Payton loves this guy so much as we believe he does how serious is Sean Payton about loving this guy as as Drew Brees is uh, uh, the success of the eventual replacement I mean because you're not gonna have your eventual replacement playing special teams true and if you listen to the broadcast you would think you know Troy Aikman sounded like Sean Payton was very high yeah. on Taysom Hill being the future at quarterback I'm not ready to buy that yet. I mean, yeah. if he was the future, I think he'd be the number two right now. And Chase Daniel is still the number two. Look, he's got some athletic ability. He's obviously got some talent. Let's hold the phone to see. We're not quite sure yet if he's a franchise quarterback. We'll find out when the draft comes around, won't we? Yeah, that's for sure. But he was injured a lot at BYU, mm -hmm. right? Four of his five seasons there, he ended with an injury. You worry about that if he's going to play special teams? Yeah, well, clearly. But, you know, on the broadcast, Troy Aikman said that Sean Payton told him, well, he's got a year to recover if he suffers a shoulder injury. <laughs> so we shall see with that. So apparently what happened was, and you could see Payton today trying to back off mm -hmm. this, trying to got, not get ahead of himself and have everybody around him in the press corps get ahead of himself about the, uh, about the Taysom Hill rumor that he was the heir apparent to Drew Brees. This is obviously something he conveyed to the Fox mm -hmm. broadcast crew uh, in their meeting mm -hmm. uh, on Saturday, and they just went with it probably over the, a bit over the top because to them it sounded like a scoop. Mm -hmm. Did I mention it? Saints are 9-0 on Fox? I was reminded no, of that by my producer. Company man. Keep mm -hmm. them on Fox. Hey, we got a question for you. This is submitted on the Final Play app using the final word feature coming from Cornelius in Marrero. 
What is the likelihood that Drew Brees will accept a team-friendly deal this after the season? If so, how much will this impact the front office's ability to keep quality players around? We do know this. Mickey Loomis is a master at moving money here and there, good or bad. We know Drew Brees is not going anywhere after this year. He's played had a fantastic year, and he's got weapons now. It all comes back to this, doesn't it? It always comes back to this. So look, well, team friendly. friendly. Right, let, let's, let's just, <laughs> let's just I, I did some numbers, okay? Let's just say Drew Brees goes to the Saints and says, you know what? Pay me like the 10th highest paid quarterback in the NFL. I think we can all argue he's in the top 10. I think we can all agree on that. Um, he's nowhere below the top 10. Well, you know what a top 10 quarterback costs right now? $22 million. That's not what fans it's want not, to hear. <laughs> it's, not, it, it's not Drew Brees. It's the market for mm -hmm. NFL quarterbacks. Mm -hmm. Now, Drew Brees makes $24 million this year. I'm just going to guess and say he's going to be somewhere near that number next year. And remember, because of the accounting of his previous contract, there's dead money and, and, and prorated bonuses they still have to account for on the books. So Saints have got to get creative here. They've got some players they can move around with some extensions like Thomas Morstead and Mark Ingram, maybe some cap casualties. But yeah, they got $35 million in cap space, but signing a franchise quarterback to an extension is not cheap. That's the mm -hmm. NFL. Mm -hmm. and and yeah. I know one thing, Drew likes his money. He does. Yeah. I don't know how friendly a deal he would give if it's way below market value. I'd say he's probably in the top six quarterbacks in the NFL right now. And I think things have changed. I could see him wanting to go somewhere else to a team who might have a shot at a Super Bowl next year if the Saints had gone off another 7-9 mm -hmm. season. But this is a this young is football yep. team mm -hmm. with a lot of talent around mm -hmm. him. And I think that might entice him to stay here, which is where he said he always wanted to end his career. Does he, he make yearly Matthew Stafford money, you think? Stafford's at 27 mil yeah. average. He's got to get over that. I, I don't know if he's going to make that. I mean, I think the number he's at right now is probably the fairest. I think he's four or five in the mm -hmm. NFL in terms of average salary, 24 and a half. That's probably pretty fair on all sides. On the fan side of it, they got to really decide what kind of quarterback they want because when mm -hmm. you look at all these other teams that are struggling, fringe mm -hmm. football teams that aren't going to be in the playoffs likely, mm -hmm. it's because they don't have a good quarterback. Mm -hmm. You've got one. You don't know how long you're going to have one, so enjoy it while it's here and pay the guy what he what he's definitely deserves. And he's shown no sign of dropping off no. whatsoever. Tom Brady's playing at 40 years old as well as he ever has. Drew Brees keeps himself in great shape. Mm -hmm. uh, he's smart enough to avoid injury. He's not going to run with a football like a Cam Newton and get hurt again, mm -hmm. you wouldn't think. So he's the guy, I think, that you want to keep around here in almost any other circumstance uh, besides not being able to afford him mm -hmm. for the next two to three years. Look, like I said, this is just the price of doing business for an NFL franchise quarterback, and the Saints have space. This isn't like they're 20 million over the cap and got to, you know, redo some accounting and, and, and extend guys that shouldn't extend or rearrange and kick, can, kick the can down the road of some players. They have space. It's going to get done. Bottom line is, Mr. Benson does not want to start over. Right. No. We all know that. And he knows his best chance of winning a second Super Bowl. No so Drew Brees and number nine in the building. All right, much more to come here. Sean, stick around. The Saints now have a stranglehold on the NFC South. Can they get back into contention for a first round buy in the NFC playoffs? We'll forecast the competition. And later, the Dirty Birds. They swept the Saints en route to a Super Bowl berth last year. What must the black and gold do to return the favor starting Thursday night? the Jim Anderson Black and Gold Review. I believe we've been calling this for the last couple weeks, December to remember. So knowing what we know now about this team, let's look ahead for the next five weeks, really four weeks now. This is what we talked about last week. They had the Carolina game. They go on the road to Atlanta, four days in between. Who's it affect more? You never, you never know. Jets at home, Atlanta at home, Tampa Bay on the road. The thinking is, and we've said this last week, if you can win your home games, you're going to clinch a playoff spot. If you mm -hmm. can win three of the next four, You've, you've then, won the NFC South. Absolutely. But there's still so much out there yeah. to win based on what the other teams are doing around them. Mm -hmm. Minnesota, Seattle, you know, uh, Rams. Currently Philly. the Saints are the fourth seed. You know, it's, it's hard to see them catching the Eagles or the Vikings. I think they could catch the Rams, but I think <coughs> it's going to be difficult to end up as the one or two seed. You know, winning Sunday was huge because I thought you had yes. to split Panthers mm -hmm. and Falcons. So winning that game was absolutely huge. Uh, at worst, you're going to be 9-4 and four after the stretch if you, if you somehow stumble to Atlanta. So I thought winning was huge. And you could tell there was some relief. And let me just say, they responded. They bounced back the way contenders bounce mm -hmm. back. I mean, they left no stone unturned. And had it not been for a couple of inopportune uh, mistakes, they would have blown out the Carolina Panthers. So I like where they are. Um, and look, everything is right there in front yes, of you to is. control. So I, I happen to think they're going to end up being a three seed. If they just went out, we'll see. 
I think the Saints have a not so difficult schedule compared to the other teams. Mm -hmm. Look at some of the other contenders in its NFC playoff picture. The Eagles, Vikings, and Rams. You look mm -hmm. at the Eagles schedule at the Rams, at the Giants, which they'll probably win easily. Oakland, you never know, depending on how Dave, Derek Carr is doing. <coughs> Dallas should win easily. The Vikings schedule, it's not so tough. You may have Aaron Rodgers back for the Green Bay mm -hmm. game. The mm -hmm. Rams, Philly. Seattle, those are two tough ones. Tennessee's mm -hmm. a playoff team. San Fran, they're playing better with a new quarterback mm -hmm. now. So mm -hmm. no one has a gimme here. I mean, it's there's some winnable games and some losable games. As long as the Saints take care of business, you never know how it's going to fall. I would say the Rams schedule's the, the, uh, yes. the toughest mm -hmm. of the three. No doubt. And look, if the Rams win, Panthers win, Saints win, you have four teams tied at 10-3. and three. There's a lot of what-ifs, I know that in those scenarios but it just goes to show you just how wild this NFC is right mm. now and if you're the Saints you can't really worry about that right you just got to worry about what's in front of you and what's in front of you is a very short week uh, against the Atlanta Falcons that might be in desperation mode so it's gonna be a tough game and that Thursday night travel mm. Jim you said in the commentary five out of the last six years I don't know if the Saints can maybe alert the league to that, but yeah. it just doesn't seem fair. you got to travel on that day, I would five of the last six years. I would years. bet they would alert the league to that in the offseason. Hey, look what you've done to us here. Mm -hmm. Five of the last six Thursday night games, us traveling. Uh, that's not fair. Let's do something about that in the upcoming schedule. The league kickoff as well this week. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And, you know, I, I heard this referred to this month as the pre-playoff round robin. And it pretty much is because you're playing so many division foes. So every week brings a new challenge, usually matching uh, division foe against division foe, which changes things markedly. That victory for the Saints yesterday really gave them a two-game lead mm -hmm. on the Panthers because of the tiebreaker. It's going to be a fun final four weeks. That's what we do now. And it's nice to be back. It's a whole back. lot of fun of being here Absolutely. in this position, doing this show it, in December with a winning record. It took us it? four years, mm -hmm. to, and I say us like we're on the team, but, <laughs> you know, it took four years to get back to this point. But this is a fun season. You like to see how things are going to play out down yeah. the stretch. Sean, thank you. Thank Once you. again, Thanks, fantastic Sean. work. All right, still to come, heavy is the crown of the NFC champions. See how the Falcons' bumpy Super Bowl hangover has resulted in a disappointing 3-3 three and three record in their brand new stadium as we preview the Saints Thursday night trip to Hotlanta. Come on back. You're watching the Jim Anderson Black and Gold Review. Bosher standing at his one yard line. Marcus Murphy awaits it at the Saints 40 and the Saints pour through and block it. It's blocked and into the end zone with is the Saints Michael Marty? What a great job, shades of Steve Gleason. <laughs> Be nice to see another one of those on Thursday night. Three and two in their last five games on a Thursday night situation. This team always plays well in primetime football, but this Thursday will be a challenge again. You've got the short rest in between. Yeah, they've gone through it before and, and prospered to a degree. Uh, what are they, three and two in the yep. last yep. five, last uh, five Thursday night games? So, yeah, they have a chance to, I think, win this week. It's going to be a tough task, but uh, they've been through it before and, and won. you got an Atlanta team that struggled last week against Minnesota. Yeah. But everybody struggled against Minnesota. 14 and 9 they lost. Uh, Matt Ryan had one of his worst days as the quarterback of the Falcons. Um, first time in two years the Falcons were held without a touchdown. Julio Jones coming off a game the week before against Tampa Bay when he had 253 yards held to two receptions for 24 yards. Falcons were just one of 10 on third down. Case Keenum who's just having a great year. Yes, he is. If he's not the comeback player of the year, he might be the MVP. Can't get Teddy Bridgewater back in the game now. No. 25 of 30 for 227 yards, showing his usual uh, great uh, ability to escape. They did get, speaking of the Falcons, Devontae Freeman back. He returned from a concussion and played well, 12 carries for 74 yards, so their running game should be in good shape. But there, it's been a Jekyll and Hyde offense, mm -hmm. as good as that team was last year. It's been a Jekyll and Hyde offense for this team this year. We'll see what happens on Thursday night. The short week means we get a double dose of black and gold review with Jim. But first things, the game, game plan moves up to Wednesday night at 10.35. Tailgate will be in prime time Thursday at 6 p.m. And then Friday, Jim is back here at 1035, and that will be followed by the finale of Fox 8 Football Friday, a championship edition of that show as well. Now I think it's time to go. Go ahead. Until then, for Jim right. and Sean and everyone at Fox 8, I'm Juan Kincaid. Thanks for watching. Our next newscast is at 430 in the morning. Have a great day. From Fox 8 Sports, this has been the Jim Henderson Black and Gold Review.